The world is sinking, but Africa is rising. It's time for Africa to turn the tide of political conflict, economic uncertainty, and moral decadence. The time is now for Africa to arise and rebuild. Inspire E-Conference 2023 will give you the tools and strategies to be part of Africa's rebuild. Join us online this August from Monday the 7th to Saturday the 12th from 7 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. East African time as we gather the brightest minds across the continent to discuss the rebuilding of Africa. Book your slot today and be part of the movement that will change Africa forever. Africa, arise and build. I'm just going to invite uh, Dr. Ruth Senyonyi, who is a seasoned counseling psychologist, esteemed director of Bethel Counseling and Consultancy Center. Uh, she's got a PhD in counselor education and supervision from Regent University in Virginia in the USA. Uh, she has a master's of arts in counseling psychology from Illinois University. And she has also attained a bachelor's in education from Macquarie University. She has a remarkable 22 year tenure in the banking sector where she has served as deputy director, welfare and counseling division in Bank of Uganda in the human resource department. Uh, she's provided valuable counseling to diverse clients and her expertise is in parenting, marriage and family therapy, career counseling, personal management, and she has also served as a Provincial Mothers' Union president until her retirement a few months ago. She's married to Reverend Dr. Kanon uh, Senyonyi, and uh, she's here with us. She's a mother. She's a grandmother as well. And so I would want us to welcome Dr. Ruth Senyonyi to speak to us. Welcome, Dr. Ruth. Thank you, thank you, my president. <laughs> She's my president, and I thank God for that. Good to see you all. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Florence, for the sharing that you have given us today. Um, we are classmates with Dr. Florence, and she used to teach me math. So I know math because of Dr. Florence Naruinda Kitabiri. Thank you for teaching me. Today I'm talking about um, mental health and wellness. I'm focusing more on wellness. Me just And um, some of the questions that um, I'm going to address are that in the past, the aspect of mental health and wellness have been medicalized, just like uh, Dr. Chitabire was speaking. Much of it has been about medical you know, what do these medical people do? How do they do it? So how do we tell these two apart? So I'm going to focus on the discussion on wellness and, and the attention that it has drawn and why it's important and why it is hinged to health. And, uh, and then how the church can come in, how can they respond? And Africa, what should we do in Africa? What should schools and workplaces do for prevention? and so on. So please um, enjoy the whole presentation I'm going to share in a few minutes. So as um, I, I, I liked what Florence was saying, because everything is very, very related. So related, it's amazing. So it's difficult to kind of just put one thing aside and talk about this, because everything is mixed up in there. So when we talk about wellness, we have to describe mental health. And she already did that, the whole definition, uh, being a state of physical, mental, and social well-being, not just the absence of disease. So you find that you don't just talk about disease. It's not there or it's there, but there's also other things. And it's very fundamental to how we think, how we emote, and how we interact and those are the things I'm going to be focusing on. Also, it helps us realize our own abilities. What can we cope with? Are we able to cope with the normal stresses of life? Are we able to work productively? Are we able to make a contribution to community? Okay, so when we, when we want to describe wellness, 
we put it down to I am functioning well or I'm not functioning well. So well-being. And I'm going to focus on those four areas, emotional, psychological, spiritual, and social. When they are well, then you are well. And, and, and I'm not going to talk about the physical because that has been covered by Dr. Florence. This is where uh, we, we find that uh, we, we ask a question, are we stable and healthy? Are we functioning well in those areas? Are we realizing our full potential? So whenever I'm a counselor, that's what I do. That's my profession. And I'm not a medical doctor. But once I, the people come to me, I want to know, are they functioning? And if they are not functioning, why? How are they feeling? What are they thinking? What is their behavior like? So what is their overall positive functioning? So we'll begin with describing a little bit about what social wellness is all about. You know, it is quite, quite loaded. And so I don't want you to think that I have, I have it covered. I have it covered so well because it is huge and large, but it will give you an insight of what as counselors we are concerned about. And uh, when someone is not healthy in, in medically, if they are not healthy in these areas, then they are not well at all. So social wellness includes social connection and support. Do you have a social connection with people? What about your social networks, the support systems? Are the relationships you have cohesive? How you relate with others? How you build nurturing and supportive relationships? Therefore, we provide people with skills. We call them relationship skills so that you are able to establish and maintain healthy and rewarding relationships with different individuals and different groups. So that you are able to communicate clearly. Sometimes people come in my office and the biggest problem there is they don't know how to communicate. Someone is just thinking outside the box. He said, oh, because he's laughing like this, he must have done something wrong. Oh, he didn't come home today. He must have an extra girlfriend somewhere you know, without communicating clearly. Also listening actively and resisting inappropriate social pressure and also negotiating conflict constructively or seeking help and offering help where and when needed. All those are social skills. So the support systems and cohesive relationships can be in marriage, a husband or a wife, can be parents, it can be friends, it can be fiancés, workmates, village mates, church members, international connections. If you have uh, those connections, there is a way that relation, you, you become better. Social skills, social, social relations. Um, an example that I just pulled out, because I could pull out relationship with, with parents, but I pulled out relationships with workmates, for example. You know, that we, that's where you have to build trust and transparency. That's where you are willing to be vulnerable with others, respecting them. We have diverse people. We have different generations, different ages, different things happening there. Courtesy to them. Some of them you may like them. Some of them you may not like them very much. So being professional, being aware of the group dynamics in the place where you are working, uh, being inclusive and avoiding dependency, prejudices, still stereotypes and the isms, you know, tribalism, genderism, nepotism at work, and then celebrating workmates. Maybe they have birthdays or achievements. So that is social. It's important to have social. That's why I'm saying that um, wellness involves the fact that you are well connected and you must have the skills for doing that. The second area is around emotional wellness. This includes also a number of things and I'm going to explain them. One is emotional intelligence. This is where you have the ability to identify, to recognize, to assess and control your emotions. Sometimes it's called perceiving, reasoning, understanding and managing emotions. That when I'm angry, 
I don't have to go around raging and beating everyone because I'm angry. I can control it. And then I can say, whoa, I am angry inside. I need to do something about it. That is emotional intelligence. That is when you are well. It doesn't mean you explode. It doesn't mean, you know, you are, you have to be able to control, manage emotions. And then it's also successful handling of stress says and adapting to change and difficult times. There are people in life when changes happen in their homes, they go berserk, if that word is there. They go, they go crazy because something has changed. When something changes in the workplace, they go crazy. When they want to do changes in a workplace, they go crazy. When, the, when their wife gives birth, the change comes and they are crazy. So being able to handle change and difficult times. When losses come, when deaths come, able to su successfully handle them. So ability to recognize that I am angry, ability to manage and ability to seek help that you know what, it's out of hand now. I need, I'm so anxious, I need to be able to be, to be helped. That is self-control. And we teach self-control to children very young. It's like you go in a store and they want a sweet. They say, I want a sweet, I want a sweet, I want a sweet. And you say, you are not going to have a sweet. You are not going to have a sweet. You are going to wait until we get home. That is teaching self-control. But some people have never gone through that. So when they get into their marriages or into their workplace, I need a rise, a pay rise. Now, now, now. If you don't give me a pay rise, I'm going to hit you. That's not emotional wellness, self-control. And then emotional wellness also includes being responsible in decision-making, ability to make constructive and respectful choices about how you behave and how you interact with others. And then making choices based on many things. It could be ethical standards, safety, concern, social norms, and so on. Okay, so that is, that, that's still under emotional wellness. And then anger management, being able to control your anger. See that little cartoon says, he who angers you controls you. So being, not, be, being out of control with your anger is something that can disturb your wellness. So sometimes we do a lot of anger management, being able to help people manage how to deal with themselves emotionally. Then forgiveness is also part of emotional wellness, avoiding re reactionary and violent responses. You know, you, you can, you know, you can be driving and someone overtakes you or a border border knocks your car. You know, those are, you can get out and hit him and he, he passes out. So avoiding violent responses, being able to say, you know what, I am cooling down. I know things are bad, but I'm not going to react right now. Being slow to speak, um, examining your cognition, thoughts and all that. So managing anger, this, this is what you do. You admit it, you express it in healthy ways, you be aware of the sources, and then you do the, the healthy dealing with that. I'm going to talk about healthy self-concept. Relaxation techniques help. Understanding the anger, learning self-control also helps. There's also preventing anger. So I've just pulled out just anger and said, if I were to deal with anger, this is what I do. Prevent it. Avoid those situations that cause you anger. Reevaluate situations. Make anger, anger constructive. Work on your self-esteem, your confidence, and so on. And cultivate love. It helps a lot. Then we move on to what we call psychological wellness, being able to function effectively. The feel good thing. I feel good. Uh, there's personal growth. I can do things on my own. I am able to deal with my inferiority, uh, my self-image. There are so many words there for self, 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 but self-worth. What is my self-concept? What is my image? What is my self-value? How do I accept myself? My self-confidence, all those self, self things. Being able to say, I know who I am and I'm worth something and I can do it. So how you perceive who you are, the mental picture of yourself, the value you place on yourself, the confidence you have in yourself and ability to set boundaries and maintain healing. Sorry, I've missed that one. And be able to maintain 
healthy relationships. Accepting that failures come. You know, some people don't know how to accept. That's a healthy self-concept. I fail, I failed here, I can get up and go. Communicating effectively, confidently, not being um, afraid to ask for help. All that is having a healthy self-concept, which is psychological wellness. Being competent, having a sense of belonging. This is where I belong, a sense of identity. This is who I am. I am secure. I'm Ruth Senyonyi and I'm secure in who I am. I don't have to get anything else, but it is me and I know who I am. I know my, 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 my problems, my weaknesses, and I know and I appreciate who I am. Now, um, these are some of the contributors. I, I like to bring this out because many people don't know what brings it. Genetics, age, family dynamics. Some people have, have different dysfunctions in their homes, self-defeating thought patterns. So we'll work through all this, you see, to make you well, to realize as a counselor, I sit there and say, mm -hmm, let's talk about your family. They're like, oh, my family did A, B, C, C. See, this is what is causing your lack of being well. And we go into there. Mental illness, discrimination. If you are discriminated against, racism, tribalism, classism, sometimes it contributes. Stress at work, sometimes trauma, it leaves a, a bit of a mark, uh, abuse, accidents, chronic illnesses, sin, you know. We are Christians and it does that. Anxiety, depression, all these affect your self-worth. Poor body image, you know, some people even alter their body, they, have, they, they, they put on more breasts or more bottoms or more whatever to look better. And those, you know, doesn't get it, add to your self-esteem, accepting who you are and what you have. Okay, anger, jealousy, those are also things that affect the, the esteem. But sometimes there are people who are full of themselves, feeling superior, feeling they are very arrogant and all that, feeling so entitlement, they are also there, inflated Self-esteem can lead to narcissistic tendencies where you are selfish, you are looking into yourself. All those affect wellness, okay? And then psychological well-being also includes the fact that you belong somewhere. You have a culture, you have an identity. I am a Muganda, and my father was this name. He came from this name. This is our dance. This is our heritage. This is our language. This is our tradition, you know, so you are proud of who you are. In Africa, we are losing that. We are picking up more of, you know, I like speaking like an American. No, speak like a Muganda, speak like a Kenyan, speak like a Zambian. It is okay. Sense of belonging is important in wellness. Strong family connections, another area that is really, really important and a safe place to grow. You are protected from the unfriendly world. Also having strong marriage relationships where you are improving communication, where you are rekindling intimacy, where there's regular good sex, where there's forgiveness, flexibility, and orderliness and a pleasantness. So those are things that we build so that we can have strong, strong, good wellness psychologically. Then uh, maintaining good attitudes is another area still under psychological, which is very important. Then spiritual wellness has already been talked about, but I just want to bring out three areas from the word of God that when you are spiritually well, like Job was described, can you be described as a man or a woman who is blameless, who is upright, who fears God, who shuns evil? Those are the things I've underlined. Who trusts God, who holds fast to the Lord, who does not stop following him, who keeps his commands, who is successful in everything that you undertake. You defeat your enemies and then committed to him. Because when we do that, in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. So when you have spiritual wellness, you get blessed. Hmm? You are walking well with the Lord. The Lord recognizes his eyes are upon you. Now I can start a sermon there, so I won't go there. But give God a place in your life. Recognize that he's the master planner. Trust him. Have quiet time of reflection. Pray, fellowship, be involved in church. 
Okay, I'm just going to finally look at prevention strategies. These, you know, that's what we say. Get enough rest, take a nap, sleep, massage, music, journal, eat well, eat lots of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, no sugar or less sugar. Now I do honey, and then some people say honey is not good. No red meat, we canceled red meat in our house, we don't eat red meat, and no alcohol, limit or stop, no drugs, avoid self-medication. Physical activity, this is important. Physical activity, aim for 30 minutes a day with a buddy or with yourself. Now, I end by saying I'm a, I'm a counselor. I am a professional counselor. I am a counseling psychologist. And I've been helping people for many, many years. And I believe that this help we can offer. So we address the emotional, the social, just as I've outlined them. Someone comes and sits in front of you and say, mm -hmm, and they tell you the story and say, mm, you are not socially well. You are not interacting well with your mother, with your father, with your brothers, with your, you know, there's a problem there. If you don't deal with it, you are going to be stressed. Stress is like this, therefore do this and do. Let's think about how to get well. Helping those people accomplish wellness. So we deal with their thoughts, their moods, their feelings, their beliefs, how they cope and their social relationships. We offer training. So Africa must look into the counseling services. I've been, I, I call myself the first professional counselor in Uganda. And I've written about it and said, when I came back from my master's studies, Many years ago, the people that were here were very good experienced in HIV counseling, but they were not taught into in professionalism. And so I joined the training and I have trained many, 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 many. So we need trainers. We need people who can train others in this trade. So now at the moment, we have about eight people, including myself, who now have PhDs in counseling in Uganda, in counseling. That is a plus, 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 plus. And we have very many trained uh, uh, master's students in this nation. And we are led by no other than my president, as I called her, Liz, Miss, Mrs. Liz O'Kell. We thank you. We are advocating for many more trainings so that we can do this. But we don't only want those people who are up at the top. We want to go down and train the local people in our who, who don't go to school so that they are able to recognize these things that are not medical and be well. Then accessibility. Are they able to access the services? Right now, I'm an expensive practitioner. When you come to see me, you have to pay a lot of money. So how can they access me? How can they make it affordable? So we do pro bono, but that's not enough either. So there's also a lot of research that is needed. I'm sure Dr. Rukundo will talk about that in whatever he's going to say. I want to thank you for listening to me. God bless you. The world is sinking, but Africa is rising. It's time for Africa to turn the tide of political conflict, economic uncertainty, and moral decadence. The time is now for Africa to arise and rebuild. Inspire E-Conference 2023 will give you the tools and strategies to be part of Africa's rebuild. Join us online this August from Monday the 7th to Saturday the 12th from 7 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. East African time as we gather the brightest minds across the continent to discuss the rebuilding of Africa. Book your slot today and be part of the movement that will change Africa forever. Africa, arise and build.